Well, welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is best-selling author Delilah S. Dawson. Delilah's new novel is The Violence. Dawson's previous work includes young adult novels Hit and Strike, Star Wars tie-in novels and short stories, and the Tales of Pale novels co-written with Kevin Hearn. Delilah, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your new novel, The Violence, how would you describe the novel? Well, The Violence is a thriller generational saga about three generations of women who are trying to fight for freedom while a pandemic that causes random bouts of rage is kind of sweeping across uh, America and the world. Random bouts of rage? That sounds familiar. Yeah, so it, it starts, you know, it starts in a in a Costco where an old woman is, uh, you know, shopping for mayonnaise brands and she drops the mayonnaise, picks up a bottle of Thousand Island dressing, turns to the nearest other shopper and beats her to death with it and then puts down the bloody bottle and goes back to uh, putting mayonnaise in her cart and slowly walks away. And so uh-huh. we learned that that's how the violence hits people. It's it's almost like a ultra rabies malaria, I guess. Do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write The Violence? I do. Um, So this book has some domestic violence in it, especially at the front end. And that's based on uh, what I grew up with, the house that I grew up in and and how my father uh, maintained control over the family. Um, And I was thinking about this because, you know, you get to a certain age, you have kids and you start really looking into what happened in your childhood and how you could try to grow beyond that and try to understand what was happening and come to terms with it. And I just remember thinking, man, I, I felt so powerless all the time. And there was no way that I could ever, ever, ever fight back. Um, you know, things would have been different if there had been a way to fight back. And then this idea just kind of came to me of, well, if what if there was a brief period of time where anyone could, you know, cause anyone grievous bodily harm and it couldn't really be your fault because you go, oh, well, I, I'm sick. It's not my fault. Like I fell for this violence. I had it. I wasn't even awake when it happened and the the government can't prosecute me. And it's like, well, that could have gotten us out of the house. You blame that, you know, you have an abuser that you can't catch otherwise. And you say, oh, they attacked me. They have, you know, this disease. And then they get uh, sent somewhere else and you can maybe live your life. So it kind of came from wishful thinking with a little bit of, you know, the pandemic hadn't started yet. So there wasn't uh, any kind of a pandemic thought in there. But, um, you know, when you think about things like malaria or rabies or Lyme disease that kind of come and go, there's other things that can come and go, too. Sure. And do you do you uh, do you find that you uh, work out kind of um, some of the, the issues that you face in life and in the popular fiction that you write? Oh, I definitely do. I never want to let it take over the books that it becomes, you know, 300 pages of whining, really. Mm -hmm. Um, So most of my books kind of turn into violent thrillers where we work through things. Um, In uh, one of my Star Wars books, Black Spire, uh, which is based on the Disney theme park Galaxy's Edge, I, you know, was writing the story of, you know, this this new world and this spy that goes there uh, and dealing with the First Order. But at the same time, I've had this thought for a while that, you know, everybody in Star Wars is pretty much a veteran who's come out of this war and, you know, we seem to think you could throw everybody in a back to take and they'll, they'll heal, but they also are going to have PTSD and, and lots of trauma. So I got to explore that a little bit in the Star Wars world. Um, my book Hit, the image mentioned earlier, um, is kind of set in a world where someone buys all of America's debt and taps the children of debtors as bounty hunters to kind of uh, cut off the dead weight, the people that are kind of never going to pay their debt back. And it has some experience in there around... Uh, a, a young teen girl out in the world and the way that men approach her. But when someone has given her a gun and said, you can't get in trouble for killing people, suddenly, again, that power shifts. So I do work through it, but I work through it in a more violent, empowering way than in a, woe is me, let's really, you know, dig deep into my pain sort of way. I, I'd much rather just give somebody a gun than, you know, stop and <laughs> spend 10 pages, woe is me. Sure. Well, what was your writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? Um, my story is kind of unusual. I was a visual artist. Um, I grew up working at a local visual arts center. I went to UGA and got my art degree. Um, I then learned how few art jobs there are in the world that pay steadily. And uh, so when my, my husband got settled into his job, we decided to have kids. Our plan was always for me to stay home. So I stayed home. Um, and with my second child, he stopped sleeping. 
and I stopped sleeping and I was getting like three and a half hours of sleep a night and I I lost it. I, I lost all of my marbles. And I went to my husband and I was like, I think I'm hearing rats whispering in the walls. And he was like, okay, well, first of all, let's get you some sleep. We're going to have like a sleep schedule. Um, but second of all, you need something to occupy your mind. You're not making art. You know, you're not going out and seeing people like everything you do is kind of just being trapped in the house with these children, like a mother pig with her piglets. You've got to do something creative or that's going to make you crazy on its own. And I was like, well, I can't do art. It's all it's all poison. Every part of art is either poison or fire. And I've got these babies everywhere. And so he's like, we should write a book. And uh, because I had a broken brain at the time, I was like, yeah, okay, sure, I'll do that. Um, I tried a few times before and I could never get past the first paragraph or page. But my brain was so broken, it just felt like, yeah, who cares? Why not? Uh, so I wrote that first book and he helped me so much. He would take the babies to the playground or to walk around Target or whatever. And I would you know, have an hour here and an hour there to work. And uh, my first book, actually, I couldn't figure out how to cut an idea. And I went to my husband because he had written some books when we were younger. Um, and he was like, well, I'll just send you a story prompt every day. And then, you know, you pick the right one and write it. So we, on the first day, he sent me the story prompt. It was a woman wins a cruise and something unexpected happens. And I was like, well, I can't write that. I've never been on a cruise. And he was like, oh, you, you're smart. You're creative. You can figure out a story to go with that. And I was like, well, I've been on a ferry in Greece. Um, and, and that was miserable for me. So I, my first book was about a woman who was on a ferry in Greece a, on a trip with her husband and accidentally slept with Zeus because, as we know, Zeus used to take on all of these various forms and trick women. <laughs> and after that happened, she started seeing all of the creatures and people of Greek myth everywhere and got like in trouble with Hera. But she'd be like walking down the streets of, you know, Piraeus and see like a three headed dog. So it was it was a very fun, rompy book. I made every mistake possible. The first line was about diarrhea, but by God, I got a book and then I queried it. <laughs> and then like 57 rejections later, I was uh, realized I needed to write a new book. So that's kind of how it started. And so what was your what was your kind of uh, process from there or, or your journey from that first book that you said you made all these mistakes to <laughs> getting your first stories or novels published? Well, Several very kind agents in my um in their their rejection letters they they took the time to give me some constructive criticism, um, which is you know a really great boon to anybody and what every aspiring writer I think hopes for. And you know one of them said, okay, well the, you have some writing chops, it's a little bit flowery, you need some self editing, but the main issue is that you clearly don't read in this genre, which I guess was you know kind of chick lit at the time. Because the one thing that the readers of the genre won't stand is infidelity. And the entire premise of your book is infidelity. <laughs> so even if it's cute and it's funny, it has merit. I can't fix this. And I was like, gotcha. That's a really good point. So, you know, by the time I got my idea for my next book, I read a bunch in the genre and I kind of made sure I wasn't going to have any of those uh, any of those kind of terrible uh, book killers where they're like, well, we, we, even if it's good, you can't publish this. Um, so my next book was about rats that lived in the walls and talked <laughs> going off of, you know, what had started this journey. It was a, a middle grade kids adventure, kind of like the littles and labyrinths, that, that sort of thing. Um, but I think just with each book, you you get better. I also learned. Uh, so with that second book, it was called Scritch. It was about, you know, this this girl who discovers that there are uh, warring rats and mice in her walls that are kind of like they can look like people. Um, and. It was it was an okay book. It got my agent. Uh, we almost sold it. Like it went for a year and a half. It was on um, you know revise and return with an editor. It didn't quite sell. But I learned that you know when an agent says to you, "Oh, I liked it, but you know I had one or two complaints," they don't want you to turn that book around in two hours and send it back to them. Like it's not a a hunt to find the missing sentence that's wrong. They want a very thoughtful two week revision where you really dig deep and listen to what they said and kind of use that to level up your book. Um, so that's what I learned with that second book. And that got me my agent. And then by my third book, uh, that's the book that sold is my first book. It's called Wicked As They Come. It's a steampunk vampire romance. That's great. Well, what was your writing process when you were working on your new novel, The Violence? Do you outline uh, your novel extensively when you're writing it? Or do you just dive into the narrative? How did that work for you? Um, every book I write, I absolutely cannot start writing until I know uh, the beginning, the instigating factor that kicks off the plot, the main, um, the main issue or problem, the climax and the ending. So my first couple of books, as long as I had that and I knew the main character extremely well, I felt qualified to start. Um, but occasionally I would have a book that punked out at 20 pages or 100 pages. 
So as I got into writing um, IP books, intellectual property like Star Wars, Firefly, that sort of thing, I was kind of forced to learn how to outline because Star Wars does not take, you know, uh, something happens as a plot. They want to know what happens <laughs> and every step of the way so that by the time you turn in a book, they're not particularly surprised. So I had to learn how to outline. And once I did, I realized, oh, if I do this ahead of time, I don't have those books punk out at 20 pages because I know what's going to happen next, which is kind of the biggest issue generally. And there's always room to, to you know, figure things out. It's not a, I don't know what happens on every single page, uh, but I, you know, know at least 80% of it and there's still room to discover things. So The Violence was actually a strange one for me. It's the first book I ever sold on spec. Meaning I had an idea, I had an outline, I had 20,000 words, and instead of presenting the editors with a full book, we presented them with the outline and the 20,000 words. Um, so it was unique. Uh, every writer hopes to do it, but then once you do it, you go, oh my God, now I have to live up to their expectations. <laughs> and it's kind of terrifying, um, especially since this book, we sold it, um, I believe, in uh, like winter of 2019. Um, so... I had to first draft this book I'd sold about a pandemic right as COVID was ramping up. Wow. Um, so, you know, you have a lot of different uh, <laughs> things you have to consider there, whether or not to include the pandemic. Lots of writers recognize that readers are really looking for an escape and they do not want to dwell in pandemic world in their books. Other writers recognize that there's a lot of story to be had in the pandemic. So, you know, that took a lot of change because from the first draft to the second draft, we'd gone from, you know, what happened in March 2020 to you know, probably, I guess, fall of 2020 or even spring of 2021, where suddenly like, oh, the things that I thought would happen absolutely didn't happen. We're going to have to do some major editing here. Uh, so most of this book was drafted in my office in Florida. I had an outside kind of garden office. Um, and of course, my whole family was home because of the pandemic. The kids were, you know, doing e-school and my husband was working from home. So rather than having the whole house to myself, like I usually was, or going to a, a coffee shop where I could go if I needed to escape them, I was kind of out in my office with a sign on the door that said, like, absolutely do not speak to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, watching, you know, it, it was kind of fascinating in that, you know, that was the period of time where you would see like a whole family ride their bikes past you, you know, and, and there weren't many cars because we'd all been told to, to stay home. Um, and, and there were a whole bunch of birds that year, I guess, because, you know, the, the climate was, I don't know, it was, it was really interesting time to be writing a book. And it was really good to have something to kind of pour my anxieties and worries and rage into. Sure. So how did the Tales of Pale novels and series come about? Oh, man. <laughs> um, Kevin Hearn is uh, one of the best human beings on this planet and one of my very best <laughs> friends. And uh, we were invited out to do a book signing in Texas with Charlene Harris and Rachel Kane. And we stayed with our friend Jay Wells. And on our way back out, we had been told we had to eat at this one barbecue joint in the airport because somehow we'd been in Texas for three days and had not had barbecue. Mm. And apparently this is sacrilege. It is. So <laughs> we go to that airport barbecue place and it's closed. It's like one of those, you know, we were there at 11. They didn't open until one or something. Oh, so no. we went to this other barbecue place and it was it was real bad. It was not good barbecue. <laughs> and we we're both sitting there like with these sad plates, just having conversation. And you know, we'd been traveling a lot together. And Kim was like, you know. I had this idea for an anthology where we invite all of our friends and everybody takes one of those tropes from high fantasy that really gets on your nerves and kind of makes a funny story about it. So he started with, you know, Kill the Farm Boy, where you think that this kid is the, the chosen one and he ever, he's pumped up as a chosen one and then he just like straight up dies. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, I want chainmail bikini because, you know, nobody, nobody's going to choose to go fight <laughs> wearing a chainmail bikini. And yet there they are on the cover of, you know, the books and comic books. And so we industriously made a list of people to tap. We started sending emails and we kind of got into it. And Kevin was like, this is too much trouble. This is like herding cats. Like my age, you know, it's hard to find an agent for this. And everybody has different timing. And it was just, we like to write. We don't really want to do all the organizational stuff we don't have to. So the idea kind of died off. And a couple months later, I was like, I can't remember who it was. I knew somebody that was co-writing a book. And I just kind of looked at this idea and I was like, Kevin, what if we just wrote this book with you and me. And then we each only have to write literally half a book. And he was like, oh, okay. So we started kind of spitballing it in Twitter DMs, kind of trading back and forth with characters and thoughts. And then with that same process, we started doing a chapter by chapter breakdown, but it wasn't like a, you know, really um, erudite, clever thinking. Oh, I have a very good idea. It was like, oh my God. And then what if the giant sneezes mucus all over them? Like it was all just trying to outdo each other and make each other giggle. 
And uh, that's how that book happened. We just took turns. So um, we came up with everything together. But then when we were first drafting, you know, it's like he'd write chapter one and he'd send it to me and I would edit it and then I and give him tons of comments about how great it was. And then I would write chapter two and send it back to him. And then he'd look at his edits on chapter one, see what he did or didn't agree with, read chapter two, do his edits, write chapter three. So it's kind of this beautiful kind of back and forth braiding of, you know, compliments and laughing and pumping up each other's jokes. And then at the end, it was like we had a second or third draft. It was a very handy process and it was just super fun. And it was also, we're both not precious. So like if he came up with a character and I was the first person to write that character, you know, there, there weren't any feelings of like ownership or diva ship. It mm-hmm. was all like, oh, that's great. I had no idea you were going to do that. So it was, it was a delight. <laughs> that's great. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? Well, um, so much of what I learned about writing and publishing, I learned online. Those were the the golden days when Twitter was sweet and kind, <laughs> and uh, and every agent and editor had a blog. <laughs> um, it was it was a land of milk and honey, honestly. But I still keep a page on my website, which is DelilahSDawson dot com. But I have a page called Writer Resources, which has a bunch of the things that are still around that really helped me. Um, different blog posts, different uh, you know editor agent pages, um, the ways to find um, agents to query. Um, I have this very long blog post I wrote for Chuck Wendig's Terrible Minds blog a long time ago called 25 Ways to Be a Traditionally Published Author that kind of uh, takes the whole process and turns it into kind of a not safe for work funny sort of list of how to get published. And it's still (laughs) relatively accurate. So I, I always send folks there when they ask for advice. But the biggest thing that helped me was that Um, For years, every time I tried to write a book, I would get stumped because I'd get to the first page and be like, if I get the heroine's eye color wrong, this book is doomed. If I give someone the wrong name, I'll never get there. I thought that there was this one perfect book that I had to find. And that's just some garbage thinking. Literally anything in a book can change. You can do find and replace for any name you want to or for an eye color. It just does not matter. So now what I say is, you know, to, you know, it helps if you know those goalposts moment. that goalpost moments, the beginning, the instigating factor, the major conflict, the climax, the ending. If you know your main character and your world and how that character is uniquely challenged by your world and why that world is especially hard for that character. Um, if you have all of those kind of, those, those uh, what do you call them? The uh, scaffolding. It's the scaffolding sure. for your story. You'll have a much better chance of getting where you're going. I know lots of people don't want to know the ending in the book until they get there. I can't write unless I know the ending because I have to know which way to aim. Uh, not knowing the ending is like saying, I'm going to go on vacation and then just getting on the road and going. I might end up someplace I don't want to be. I want If I'm going to the Grand Canyon, I want to get to the Grand Canyon and I don't care where I stop or you know eat lunch on the way there. But like I want to end up where I know I'm ending up so that I know that I'm <laughs> going on the right route, having the character you know make the right choices with their motivation. But the best thing I could ever say is like that first draft, make it hot and fast you know, go through it as quick as you can. Uh, keep that momentum going. Every day, end in a place where you know what happens the next day and think about it all night. Because the worst thing that can ever happen is you get a white page and you don't know what happens and you just stare at it and you start to doubt yourself. And then you go reread the last chapter and all you see are the errors and the mistakes. And then, you know, you're, that, that impetus just kind of withers. But you've got to keep up that energy for it. So yeah, my first drafts are fast, dirty things. Um, I keep a little list of note cards next to me and when I need to know I need to change something so I know to go back and change it later. Um, but I don't stop. Like I don't go back and read something. I don't go back to chapter two to add in that scene. I just write on my little note card, you know, add emotional scene in chapter two and then I know on my second draft to do it. So that's, you just got to get through it because you can't fix uh, a draft that doesn't exist, but you have the crappiest first draft in the world. You can fix that. There's hope there. Got it. Are you working on a new novel now? Oh, I'm, I'm always working on a whole bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of short stories in the works. Uh, I'm working on a, a my second novel um, in this contract. So when Delray bought The Violence, they bought a, a second adult book as well. So I'm working on that one, which is turning into, it looks like a kind of feminist horror sort of book um, <laughs> set in the North Georgia mountains because I, I love Georgia. Um, and I've got a couple of, you know, secret projects that haven't been announced yet, but I, I'm always working on something. And if I'm not, I'm working on the next thing. That's great. Well, what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh man, that's a good question. Um, 
when I'm working on a book, especially when I'm first drafting, I I can't really read anything um, super affecting that might sway me in that way. I have to read something in a completely other genre and another tone. Um, so I've been kind of working on these more kind of serious, you know, I, they're not tomes, but they're not, you know, straight up popcorn either. So mm-hmm. mainly I've been reading psychological thriller lately. And I'll admit it, they kind of all blend together. You can see all their covers <laughs> with the big words and the girl in the snow or the tricycle overturned in the in the grass. But I, I go to bookbub.com and buy the kind of cheap ebooks and, and just devour them. Um, right now I'm reading Malice by Heather Walters. I recently read uh, Book of Accidents by Chuck Wendig. Um, I got in my queue, Paradox Hotel by Rob Hart. Um, and also Portrait of a Thief by Grace Lee I read recently, which is really great. But yeah, for the most part, it is uh, it is me, you know, with my Kindle loaded, uh, you know, in the bathtub <laughs> reading about terrible things that happen to women in the snow, typically. <laughs> great. Well, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novels? I'm pretty easy to find. I'm Delilah S. Dawson everywhere. So that's on Twitter and Instagram. And then my website is DelilahSDawson.com. Uh, and I kind of, those are the three places where you can find me the most. Um, on Twitter, if you reach out to me, I will, you know, usually talk back to you. No, not, not in a rude way. That sounds like a small child talking back to you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to sass you, but, um, you'll respond. <laughs> so many people were really kind to me on Twitter when I was getting started that I used to really like to give um, a lot of writing advice there. I did this thing where I would do 10 things where every day I would pick a topic and do this long tweet thread about it. But uh, Twitter is, is not the kindest place these days, especially once you have over 10,000 followers. And uh, so I've kind of stopped that for the point being. Um, I do do like a little writing thread every day, just a couple little thoughts on writing. But if you ask me a writing question um, about writing or publishing, I will generally answer it if it's in good faith. I might just point you to an article I've already written on it. But um, I don't, I don't, no one ever needs to feel like they're alone and they can't find the answers in publishing. There are so many uh, good resources out there and so many good hearted people that are cheering you on and want you to be able to, you know, finish your book and, and publish it and all that. Like writer Twitter is just really uplifting and most of us are really happy to help and to see other people succeed. That's great. Again, we've been speaking with Delilah S. Dawson, author of the new novel, The Violence. The novel is on sale now, so go buy a copy at your local independent bookstore. And Delilah, thanks for doing this interview. Thanks so much for having me. This has been great. This was great. Now, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of The Violence by Delilah S. Dawson, narrated by Hilary Huber, available from PRH Audio wherever audiobooks are sold. Chelsea is pouring another cup of coffee that will barely touch her bone-deep disquiet when the doorbell rings, sending her entire body rigid. She scans the wall calendar, the dates empty of commitments, and the top crammed with posed pictures of her family in matching crisp white shirts, but no one is due to work on the house or make a delivery. Between Dream Vitality and David, most of her old friends keep their distance these days, which means only one thing. Her feet already know it and are propelling her backward, away from the soaring foyer and toward the laundry room, where the windows are too high up to tattle on her as she hides. The garage door is closed, after all. There's no way to tell she's home. And then her phone buzzes in her hand, and the text pops up on the screen, I know you're in there. Even the laundry room can't save her. Back in the kitchen, she gulps her coffee and slams the gray ceramic mug down almost too hard, the blonde liquid splashing onto the black granite. She hurries to the huge master bathroom, brushing her hair and touching up her lipstick. Her mascara is running, just a little, making her blue eyes pop and she dabs a tissue under each eye. There's a tiny coffee stain on her shirt, so she throws on a new one and jabs mid-sized diamond studs into her ears. Not so small that they look like all she can afford, but not so big that it seems like she's trying too hard. When the knock comes, it's light and jovial. Tap, 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 tap. It's just little old me, the knock seems to say. Just a friendly visit. If malignant narcissism could knock, it would sound like that. 
Knowing that if she doesn't hurry, she'll hear the scrape of the mat being moved aside and the emergency key turning in the lock, Chelsea scurries across the tile, checks the peephole to confirm, and opens the door with the sort of smile that chimps use when they're about to get torn limb from limb by bigger chimps. Well, that took you long enough says Patricia Lane, her own answering smile proper and polite, and yet the sort that reflects the stronger ape promising a primordial beatdown with a femur bone. 86 degrees today, in April. I'm lucky I didn't melt out here. Witches melt in rain, not sun, Chelsea wants to say, but doesn't. And you've lived in central Florida your whole life, so move away if you hate it so much. But just like with David, talking back only makes it worse. Hi, Mom. Come on in. There is no hug, no posh and affected air kisses, definitely no real kisses. There never have been. Patricia straightens the cardigan knotted over her silk shell and looks down her nose at her only daughter before sweeping into the foyer. I'm not a vampire, darling. I'm family. I'm always welcome. If she's being honest, Chelsea knows her mother looks more like she's actually Chelsea's older sister. Patricia's hair is blonder, her face is tanner and still smooth, her clothes are neater, and her figure is still so trim that they could trade clothes if they had anything close to the same taste. The diamonds in her ears and on her fingers and wrist don't say, I'm just the right size. They suggest that, given the slightest provocation, they would delicately shred you to ribbons while explaining the Mohs scale in the most patronizing manner possible. Chelsea's mother, as David says, puts in the work. As Chelsea locks the door behind her, Patricia turns a slow circle, raising one perfect eyebrow at the chandelier. You have to remind them to dust, dear, she says, almost sad. Let these once-a-week cleaning services get away with one thing, and soon they'll stop dusting the baseboards, and you'll find cash missing. Give them an inch, they'll take a mile. Chelsea looks up at the chandelier, but can't see any dust. So what did you need, she asks, hoping to end the visit as soon as possible while still appearing polite so she won't get another lecture. Patricia's gaze stops checking the glass over the family portraits for water spots and lands on Chelsea, the older woman's frown going deeper without making any creases in the smoothly filled putty of her face. Does a mother need a reason to visit her daughter, she asks, sounding wounded. Can I not simply take a loving interest in your life? Chelsea smiles as her teeth grind together. Of course you can. What did you want to talk about? Ella and Brooklyn are doing well in school. Patricia sighs the sigh of the sorely aggrieved and swans toward the kitchen, where she plucks a mug from its hook, frowns at its interior, and wipes it out with the kitchen towel before pouring herself a cup of black coffee. She sips it eyes closed, expectant, then makes a face. These beans are burned, I told you. You can't just buy any old bag at the store.